Yeah, the next speaker is uh, Professor Suresh Babu from University of Tennessee, okay. USA. Thank you. Um, yeah, Thank he's you. going to talk about a uh, flash microstructure. Where uh, yesterday we have an interesting talk from Gary Kola, and this is the continuation of that work. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, it's always a pleasure to come back to Cambridge, and this is where I started my adventure in steels with Harry. So this continues on. So this adventure right now is uh, actually inspired by Gary. So I should give all the credit to Gary. And most of the work in this case is done by my students, Tapasi Lola and Brian Hanhold and David Tung. And these are the three students in succession have discovered different areas why this flash microstructure works. So I'm going to kind of give you five nuggets of information in my 20 minutes. So, OK, so traditionally, we have been optimizing steel microstructure and properties in different ways. Quench and tempering, ma tempering, you form out inside in temper right away. Os tempering, you hold it at the bay, allow for the bainite to form and cool down. So there are very many ways we could go and get the better properties on that. So it's always when somebody comes out and says, oh, I got a new way to do it, the first thing you start off with is very skepticism. But that's how I started, but slowly I was converted. So let's see how the conversion process occurred. Okay. So, so what is flash microstructure? So Gary didn't mention uh, in detail, so I'm going to just going to go through. First thing we did is took the uh, steel and went through an extensive amount of characterization. So what you see right away is a small prior arsenide grain size, less, around 20 microns or so. In addition to that, it had somewhat called mixed bainite microstructure. How would I know from optical? You'll see in a moment that we did a lot of TEM work and also. But the most important thing which we figure, saw right away is this uh, kind of blobby carbide showing up in the, uh, in the structure. So this is really was the tipping point to show that why this could be working. And this was uniform distribution of carbides, too. And so that's the optical microstructure. And then um, Tapas, we did a lot of electron backscatter diffraction imaging. And then he saw that the packet size is also very fine. So that goes back to Professor Maki's group, where they showed that by reducing the packet size, you can go up in the strength. So we said, oh, that could be the one more reason why we may be getting better strength properties in this particular flash microstructure. But the question is, is it bainite or is it modern site? What are these carbides? Why did we see these carbides which we saw in optical metallography? So the next step is to go into uh, looking at that much more depth in electron microscope. And that's what we did. And uh, so what you may notice, the next structure is going and looking at uh, much more depth. Is uh, You see this ni nice classical like bainite sheaves, which you can see it in Harris' book also. And uh, you see nice subunits forming. And immediately we saw that, OK, there is a bainite microstructure there. In addition to that, a lot of modern city structure also away from these regions. So it was kind of mixed also. In addition to that, we also saw a lot of carbides. And what really intrigued me is these carbides are very huge. If you look at the thermal cycle, which I'll show you in a moment, these carbides can never form during the thermal cycle. So they should have been already existing and went through the for the ride through the thermal cycle, so this should be undissolved carbide. So that's what we told us. In addition to that, these carbides were enriched in chromium. So it could never occur during the flash processing also. And also, we, had a, uh, we were lucky to go and do some atom probe work in Professor Hono's group. And we saw a lot of carbon redistribution. But however, we were also clear that there is no way we can do atom probe in each and every region because it's completely heterogeneous microstructure too. Now, let's go back to how did we get this microstructure? So Gary told you about it. You take the steel sheet, go through it, heat it up very quickly, and then quench it in the water. So the first impression you would have thought is, ah, this should have given you 100% modern site. It should be brittle. So that's what my initial reaction was. But I already showed, convinced me that there is appreciable amount of ductility present in this too. So what is the mechanism? So Tapas, we went through quite a lot of uh, analysis, a lot of microstructures, and came up with this hypothesis. So the, the initial microstructure, this particular steel was 8620, that was the original steel Gary worked on it, was periodized microstructure. So that's what the schematically shown. This is actually our experimentally measured thermal cycle during flash processing. Of course, this wasn't easy to get it, so we had to use a tube put a thermocouple underneath so that it doesn't, water doesn't immediately hit the thermocouple. That's how we got this thermal cycle. 
So you can see a gentle preheat because the, the sample is reaching the hot point, very quick heat up, very short hold time, and then there it goes, a very, very fast quench. So initially you have kind of spheroidized carbides, and as it gets heated up, you get the austenite formation, but not much time for these carbides to dissolve. This is not new. People have seen that in the case of chrome chrome rich uh, m 236 don't dissolve in austenite even after one hour. So then you quench down. So what, because of that, what happens is the original austenite, which is before quenching, is not homogeneous in carbon concentration. That's our hypothesis. And that's how we explain what microstructure we are getting. I wish we have an institute tool to follow this. We only follow this only temperature. We can't do this right now, even in any synchrotron experiments. But that's one thing which we are thinking about how to do this later. But most important thing is, what does it do with this flash microstructure? So this is Gary's data. I'm putting it in collection of all the data available on this uh, so-called banana curve. And uh, you can see that these are the data which uh, Gary produced in his uh, um, shop and the different samples, different materials. That's how the microstructure comes. And we started wondering, why do we get this Im uh, improved strength more than the modern static microstructure? And this is also not new. Professor Badisha published this already. You can see volume fraction of bayonet increasing. You go through a little bit of yield strength increase. Of course, we are kind of transcending that yield strength effect to the tensile strength here also. But however, this mixed microstructure is the main reason why we get these unique properties. Now, the question which we have to understand is, OK, so good. Can we actually design this a priori? Now we have stumbled onto this discovery. Can we actually design this? So the key parameter for this is undissolved carbides. So we need to make sure the carbides don't dissolve when you go through a, this rapid thermal cycling, short hold, and cooling down. That's the key. And again, this is not new. This has been addressed by many researchers in the literature. So we said, OK, let's take that and then see how we can understand this also. So what we, this is readily can be done in a dictra. You take a, a M, M, M3C carbide, spherical coordinates, put it in alpha, and heat it up and cool down. And then you say that, well, around this interface, you can form austenite, and then that austenite can grow into both cementite and alpha. So that's what we are doing. So we wanted to compare a pure cementite with no alloying addition and with alloying addition. So that's what we did in our simulation. I'll go through a series of graphs and explain what we found in this. So it may not be uh, very new for you. Already you can know the reason what's happening. So, so let's see cementite. So this is a system uh, definite boundary conditions we are using. So you can see that a more, more specifically I would like to discuss is the what is the cementite concentration of chromium, which are going to use in the case of an alloyed steel. And these carbon concentration, cementite, chromium concentration in the ferrite, all of them were taken from at a particular temperature. If you do an equilibrium, like a spiritizing treatment, what would be the concentration? That's what we are using here. And then we heat it up at 110, 100. You will know that why I didn't go above 100 degrees centigrade in a moment. Okay. So let's see cementite, just Fe3C. OK, so let me explain this diagram. This is a temperature versus time in logarithmic scale. And you're heating up quickly. This is 1 degree centigrade. Please allow me to. It's not slow heating. But still, let's uh, talk about what happens in phase transformation. And then this is a cementite here. And this is a ferrite. That's the interface. So if we heat up very, very slowly, as expected, you would notice that cementite will dissolve into ferrite, which is well known. If you look at the para equilibrium boundary, you can see that it is actually takes a lot more carbon into it. So the cementite actually dissolves if you heat up very, very slowly. And then austenite forms, and then austenite grows into it. Nothing new, as expected, in a simple iron carbon system. OK, this is at slow heating rates. Let's go up in high heating rates. If we go to very high heating rates at 10 degrees, you'll see the similar cementite dissolves. And then austenite starts from an interface. There's no, it doesn't nucleate until we go to high temperature there. But when you go to 100 degrees centigrade per second, now you can see the kinetic starts playing a role. So the cementite dissolves slowly. But before it can completely dissolve, you get the austenite at the interface. And the austenite starts consuming both cementite and austenite. And then you get this uh, complete dissolution of uh, cementite. And then you get complete austenite. Everything's so good. No problem. This is what 
expected in the case of a simple Fe3C. Now, let's think about what happens in a cemented which is enriched in chromium, which you would see after spheroidization treatment. Okay, so this is the data. The gain interface location given in the logarithmic here. I just wanted to show that cemented in ferrite, that's why it's in logarithmic and logarithmic time axis, and this is temperature. Now, what do you see? Cementite does not dissolve at all. Only thing is austenite completely uh, grows over the ferrite. And at the end of this uh, 100 degrees centigrade per second, when you reach this point around 1,000, which is the peak temperature, which Gary Yusser said, you only have austenite and cementite. And now you can see that why this works. So this is uh, well known in the field work on alloy steels that you have to hold for more than a two hours to before M23. C6 dissolves, even in this case, cementite, because the chromium diffusion is very sluggish. That's why this is, doesn't dissolve. But there are some theoretical questions you can ask that will cementite go massively into austenite with that concentration? We can't justify that with the current theoretical data which we have. We believe that cementite will stay as it is if you use chromium enriched at that high temperature. Now you can go in much more depth what Dictra says. This is the original tie line, and you can see the tie line keeps moving as you are going through the simulation, and that's the end of the simulation where you can see there's a mole fraction of carbon versus distance, and then that was at the room temperature. We just dissolved very little, even at one degree centigrade per second. And what you also notice, very interestingly, is there's a chromium enriched austenite too. This gives another fundamental problem for us. We'll talk about that in a moment. So this on cooling, may actually transform probably ferrites may nucleate preferentially also there, but there is high carbon too. So what is going to happen with this innovingenious austenite in front of the cementite? So what can we do? So there is no way we have a, a calculation of CCT diagram for this innovingenious austenite. So we said, okay, what can we do? We can take a composition of steel at different locations and see, calculate a CCT diagram. This is, again, you can do it. You can download this program. It's called MUCG46 from MATWEB. You can do this calculation uh, where you can see that this is temperature versus time. And then this is the calculated CCT diagram for this very low carbon austenite further away from the cementite. You can argue with me saying that, are you really sure that there is a bainitic temperature? This is valid for this calculation. We don't have a CCT diagram at this low carbon experimentally measured because if you are able to do that, you will get ferrite because it quickly transforms at slow cooling rates. So you can see this is our cooling rate. According to that, you should have a mixture of both bainite and martensite forming even in this uh, uh, high gamma further away there. Of course, we are assuming that carbon didn't completely go there also. But what happens to this highly enriched austenite sitting right close to the cementite? This is the composition, and if you we don't have any way to calculate because the, uh, the CCT calculation is not valid for these highly alloyed conditions. So we can only calculate what would be the T0 temperature, and that is around 730 degrees. That means that should transform readily to a modern side with high chromium regions. So there is only eludes. I don't have an experimental proof that we have been trying to do a FIB analysis across this to still find out whether there is enriched. It's been a pretty hard. One day we will get there. So that's our theory so far. So now you can ask, okay, Suresh, you have all this theory. Can we prove, start from the scratch and come up with a new steel using flash processing? So that's what I'm going to talk about in the coming eight minutes on this. Okay, so the challenge was posed to Gary saying that, okay, you did this 8620. Can, can you develop a flash process to get a steel which has armor quality? So we already have design rules now. Number one, we need spheroidized steel. That's given. We understood that. And then the cementite should be chromium enriched. So first thing we will do is the initial microstructure we're going to get, we will check, make sure it is spheroidized, and then the cementite is enriched in chromium. That's pretty good, too. And then we need our flash thermal cycle. So those are the three things. But however, we also need a reference point. So we used a commercially available high hard material. But what is important you notice is the carbon levels are similar. The only difference is the chromium levels are changing. So you can see composition is more or less similar to what you get from high heart. Now, let's see the initial microstructure. So this is our initial microstructure before flash processing, spiritized. 
And I would like you to kind of take this in a little bit. You will see this banding nature, and then the carbides are non-uniform but spheroidized. And this is a hardness map. We nowadays, we do any steel which you are working on, we don't do one hardness. We actually do a hardness map to see a spatial inhomogeneity, which we are starting with already. And you can see there is already a, some inhomogeneity in the original plate we are receiving. And this is not only with our steels. You can see it in high art, too. I'm not going to talk about this in this lecture. We'll see later, OK? So spatial distribution, that's the original structure. Now let's go through the flash processing. So we do the flash processing, again, consistently. We see this carbides there, very fine austenite grain size, mixed microstructure, what we saw in H60. It was like really interesting. In respect of the two different steels, the microstructure looks similar. And then we did the harness map, and then we see that the carbide distributions are a little bit different. But of course, this is mainly comes because of the inherent segregation, which we had originally, too. And that also leads to an hardness gradient. I would like you to point out that even though colors look different, the minimum hardness here is 500 compared to 600. Previous one was very soft. OK. We just proved that flash microstructure works. We can get the flash microstructure. The question is, did we get good mechanical, good ballistic properties? So this is a tensile test data um, um, Brian did. Brian Hanold is we said Ford right now. He went through a very um, critical analysis of everything. We did the similar testing conditions, similar geometry for a high heart, similar geometry for flash process. So the geometry effect was completely eliminated. And then we uh, also did quite a lot of harness mapping and then everything to show that, that the properties of the flash process are a little bit better than I heart material. That's encouraging. So, but in all, both the cases, we have a through thickness hardness gradient. So I want you to keep that in your mind when you see the ballistic test. Now, what happened with the ballistic testing? I cannot give you the details about the rounds used and everything. I think if you're interested, talk to Gary about that, OK? And this is the original plate. You can see that inherently there is a segregation there. And this is uh, um, the flash process. And then the hardness maps are there. You can see that there's a hard here, a little bit soft there. And that's what before impact. And then after impact, you can see this is where the bullet struck. And you can see a crack formed, and it bifurcates here. And then it is very, very interesting. We still don't understand that there is a humongous amount of hardening going on across the whole sample through thickness, too. But the what key point which you have to remember is look at the crack, how it is deflected, and it stopped the bullet. And this uh, gave very good a feel, sense of feeling, gratitude that yes, it works. It can give a ballistic property by just going through the flash processing. So we could engineer the properties by going through step by step by step. So that was good. Now, of course, the challenge adventure continues on. So we said, oh, we got this one. Then they said, why didn't you do structural armor? That means able to weld it. So the key question which was asked to Gary is, OK, you do flash processing. Is it possible to make construction like this? Can you meld, weld these things uh, with this flash process steel? You show that uh, can you weld it, then it may be a good idea to do that. So that led to Brian's whole master's thesis. And then he actually did a lot of weldability analysis on that. So I'm going to give you salient results of that, OK? Let's talk about uh, what happens first when you do gas metal arc welding. And this is a gas metal arc welding process routinely used. If you go and you can actually download this as a standard practice given for any armor and plates, this is a standard uh, welding voltage, current, and everything you have to use. And then we used a particular filler metal. Don't worry about filler metal. This is the heat affected zone here. And you can see it's not very hard. It's soft. And it also creates a huge heat affected zone. And then if you aim and shoot at that, uh, that heat affected zone, no wonder the bullet goes right through. So that means heat affected zone is the most weak point. But yes, it is 22 millimeters there. Then Gary challenged Brian, saying that, why don't you reduce the amount of heat affected zone? Can you do that? So that is the time, around 2010 or so, we were getting this fiber optics lasers, uh, fiber lasers coming on board our next door neighbor uh, in EWI. So we said, why don't we go to the laser welding process and see whether we can reduce it? So that's what we did. And uh, by doing laser welding, what we have done is we minimize the heat affected zone thickness. Of course, you can, what's interesting is that you do get hard microstructure in the metal and also in the 
uh, base metal, the amount of softening is also minimized there also. And fortunately, there is no cracking either also. So that's good news. Then Gary was not satisfied with that. He said, I want to make sure that if I hit the bullet at the heat affected zone, will it stay? As indeed, it isn't because it's soft. It goes right through. This is the table underneath the table, uh, underneath the plate. Okay, you can see it. And that shows that we have reduced the heat affected zone uh, thickness. So we have decreased the vulnerability, but still there. You can't cheat Mother Nature in the welding process because there is going to be a peak temperature. You are going to take them into solution, the carbides at that peak temperature. So there is no way we can get the flash microstructure in the heat affected zone repeatedly. Okay, so this is where I would like to point out a little bit more in depth the inherent my heterogeneity we see. And uh, this is a hardness map after the failed samples. We looked at it. Brian walked by my office and looked fresh. This is interesting. What happened is the bullet hits, and then the crack actually goes to the middle of that where you had the soft microstructure initially. So it seems to be some indication that we can engineer these microstructures in a way to deflect the crack path. And that way, we may be able to get better ballistic performance in that. We haven't solved that issue yet, but this gave some ideas how we can tweak inherent macro segregation and the flash processing to come up with unique microstructures also. So that's our future directions. Gary drives us crazy every day. He calls me up, can you do this, can you do this? So we are working every way to see how we can take this uh, flash processing to be relevant to wide range of applications on that. So that comes to my 20 minutes. I'd like to stop here. So there are three questions. What did we find? What are our design rules? What is the significance? So you can read the answers there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Suresh. Um, OK. Suresh, very, very exciting talk. Uh, a peripheral issue. Sure. You are showing a plate that is 6 to 8 millimeter thick. And you are saying that for your process to work, you need to heat and cool very rapidly. Agreed. It would be very worthwhile so that your results can be reproduced irrespective of whether it is done at Ohio State or Penn State or Cambridge University. Agreed. For you to specify what is the sensitivity of your process on the heating and cooling rates and how fast you can actually heat up and homogenize that, that stuff. Because it's one thing to say 200 micrometer sample that you can heat and cool very rapidly. It's another thing to say that you take a half an inch to an inch sample and you heat it at, at a zillion degrees centigrade per second and cool it at zillion degrees centigrade per second and you get these wonderful microstructures. Understood. So sprinkle some ifs and buts, it will save you a lot of hassles. No problem. Thank you. I think that's a great way to segue to, I would like to talk about Gary's uh, because we can't heat one inch. We are not heating very high heating rates. We are heating up at 400 degrees centigrade per second and cooling and the water quench process. So what Gary has innovated around, this is where Gary, I'm going to rely on you, to heat up, he has actually put end effectors in induction heating so that you can penetrate deeper also. He works with uh, people who are very good in induction heating processes. They work with him closely on that. So can we do it in Ohio State, Cambridge, or different places? Gary is ready to deploy systems wherever you want. You can actually take it and do evaluation for your own self, because these equipments are actually deployed in other places too. Correct, Guy. So if I answer that question. So there is actually, it's 400 degrees centigrade per second, heating rate, all those things can be reproduced. But not too thick. I agree. Yeah. Go Shuresh, ahead. Shuresh, uh, yes. Uh, two quick questions. One, uh, whether you need to add, we need to add chromium all the time to get these properties. Number one. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's interesting. So the what our whole thing relies on undissolved carbides. If I can make sure the carbides don't dissolve, that means the carbon is stuck in that. Which one? The chromium is the most easier for me right now. Yeah. But yesterday, like. Gary was talking about an alloy which is ten ten. So okay. there, I guess there is no chromium. So then you had to worry with the peak temperature. That's what Gary mentioned. You remember? So you, so you have how many things you have? You have a chemical way you can control or a temperature time you can control. So you could, if you don't have that liberty, then you have to do the temperature time. 
So you can ask me a question, Suresh, do you know what the temperature time would be if it is not allied with the cementite? I don't know right now, but we could calculate that. So. And, and another question, uh, you know, yesterday also Gary was mentioning, and then today also you mentioned that uh, uh, this is stronger than martensite. That's correct. No? Now, what Harry probably in Harry's paper it was shown that that is on ill strength, and that is because of the free dislocations or no free dislocations. Agreed. But that doesn't that doesn't go into martensite. I guess. Agree. I transcended there to show the tensile strength. I didn't mention that it is based on ill strength, but we don't know how that ill strength because we need to go in depth on the strain handling behavior of martensite, whether strain partitioning is occurring to martensite or uh, to the Benedict ferrite. This is a real problem because we don't have a very beautiful, nice microstructures completely dispersed inside. So we talked about doing in situ neutron. There is no way we can say which is martensite is getting strained or the ferrite is getting strained. It's a good question. We don't know where the strain is partitioning. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, uh, can yes. we, okay, go ahead. Can we look again at your slide number 19? Sure, we'll go there. It's working. There it is. Um, firstly, I would have expected on the right-hand side for the crack to appear on the opposite side where the stress tensile. And the second question was where the crack um, deviates sideways. Is that associated with this change in contrast on the left-hand side? Yes. Where you see the darker and the That's correct. Lighter. That's correct. We, I don't know why the crack started on the compressive when it is hitting there. I have no idea because this is a region where I don't have expertise on ballistic uh, stress strain hardening. And uh, even if I can find somebody, they won't work with me on that, so uh, on open literature. So, but that you are correct, the bifurcation occurred where there's a gradient occurs there. That's correct. The gradient of what exactly? The hardness. This is a hardness, yeah. Signal the upper figure. The upper figure is. Uh, and then okay, this contrast is big. Quite a it is. It is. It, this contrast, you, this is in our flash process. It is there even in high hard materials too. They have a similar contrast there also. Uh, and that change of contrast is exactly where the crack changes direction. That's, uh, yes, because you can see it's compressing a little bit. If you walk backwards, that is where it is. So that's what Brian told me that. He educated me on that. So. That's the part that was oscillated the surface. So uh, is through, through the whole thickness. Uh, it, it, this change, the hardness, that's changed through thickness from the original microstructure, John. It did. But there is an inherent segregation in the sample. We, that's what we receive from the steel makers. So the question is, what is that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I have two questions, Suresh. One yeah. is, when the carbide, carbide, chromium-rich carbide does not dissolve, how does austenite get enriched with chromium? Good question. Okay. Dig try this simulation we have done. We have done with the point, uh, how much, I forgot, 0.5 micron thick. If I had a different population and C distributed around, and then some of them may dissolve, and you may have that, because I'm only doing one carbide at a time. If you think about the whole structure, there's a lot of carbides there. So I wish I could do that. My, my second question is, yeah. the thermal cycle in the heat affected zone is very similar to the flash process. Agreed. But why does it then soften? So, so peak so temperature. Perhaps tune the parameters in such a way yes. that in the heat affected zone, you do flashing. As sure. Well. That's also our original goal. Gary actually pushed us to say that, well, in the heat affected zone, you have a similar thermal cycle if you go to laser. So why didn't you get it? So the main thing is you have to remember is the peak temperature. Peak temperature is very high. If you go, it doesn't matter whether chromium or there, it is going to dissolve. You, you can actually do that simulation, go down 1,400 degrees, diffusivity goes through the roof. Yes. Francisco. Yes, I wonder why you have not yet uh, checked those carbon and chromium concentration profiles. Chromium, it will be really easy with EDS or electron proof microanalysis. Carbon is a little bit harder, but you know, atom proof tomography. Yes, yes, that is what we have been trying. So I don't know how many of you tried the chromium car cementide and uh, ferrite and then doing uh, atom probe. It's not easy, as you may know. It, in the, if, you use a la if you use a laser, uh, Mike Miller said that using laser is not a good idea for this kind of compositional analysis. But we have tried both atom, uh, but voltage probe and laser probe. And the main, many times when we do that, it just ruptures that carbide. So I spent six months to get one M23C6 and austenite boundary. I know the problem. But we are not giving up. We will go there. We will. So. The carbide metal is 2.5. They are, are quartz and micro. 
Microprobe, but, the, but we tried doing yields analysis across that. We don't have that resolution to see whether there is any chromium concentration there also. Hi, hi, Suresh. Uh, you, indeed, you, you did a good work. And uh, I would like to know the exact microstructure because uh, first, uh, the first point is uh, we would like to get a nano size carbide in the US structure. And the second point is uh, you have mentioned about uh, the optimal property is with the 20% band line That's and 80% uh, money side. Uh, I would like to now, how did see we the come? evidence. Okay. okay, how did we come to that? Okay, let me ask two One of the things about, do you want the nanocarbides? So remember, um, I think Gary mentioned that after flash processing, sometimes you do a secondary tempering too. You may have some carbides doing that. And then the next question you asked is, uh, okay, I skipped. Sorry. Twenty percent band line. Yeah. And 80 so that was money. that was based on our back calculation of the strength we have got and using Harry's model. Yeah. Go ahead, Harry. Right. One uh, quick correction. The peak in strength occurs both in the yield strength and the ultimate tensile strength. Okay, so that's uh, page 307. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so I stand corrected. So Harry, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of internet questions. OK. Yeah. So those, um, they basically concern the carb, the pre, the prior carbide distribution. Is it better, if, do, have you any idea whether, uh, whether a finer carbide distribution would be better? And also, how are you currently achieving your spheroidized microstructure? OK, good question. So can I, uh, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, you can yeah. hear me? OK, is it, uh, what kind of carbide population, size distribution is important? That's the first question. We need to have undissolved carbide. That's clear. clear. We know. So the, uh, we can only tell you what is the average carbide constant based on our analysis. What is the tail and what should be that one? We don't know yet. So that is something that needs much more work. And uh, having finite distribution is not a good idea because it will dissolve. What's the second question? Uh, the second question was about um, how are we getting that? So, okay. Yeah. So this, we are at the mercy of the steel companies. Gary, is that correct? So whatever they do, spheroidization, that's what we got, correct? One of our limitations with the process has been that we've worked with commercial off-the-shelf steels. So an example of 4130, we've gone through three or four different steel makers. We've gotten multiple heats. So there's probably been at least seven or eight different heats from these steel makers of 4130. And now with the 4140, we've tried four different um, heats of steel from two different makers. The results seem to be very, very similar. So more dependent on carbon concentration for your strength than, than other factors. Okay, Thank you. I hope that answered the question. So, yes, John. Um, so I'd like to ask a, I'm kind of loud, but okay. um, I'd like to ask a general question, not exactly related to flash processing, but um, so if we could create better properties with undissolved carbides, that's not too difficult to do in a, in a more general processing sense in, in, in other steels that are processed in other ways. So, so what would, so you, you may not actually need to heat quickly or what are the time temperature considerations where you might apply this physical metallurgy concept? Okay, that's in, a very, so right? since it is very generic, I'm going to take liberty on taking that division wise, okay. So what does this gives us? So now you don't need to go through the expensive doing austenitizing, hold it for a long time, quench and tempering. Rather, you do a very slow process up front, get a particular distribution of carbide, and go through, switch the fried austenite and cool down and get a microstructure. You're done. We don't need to do the tempering. That will be the key. If I can, we can do that, that'll be beautiful. That's, that is what brings a new area into this area. But we ne always, as Gary pointed yesterday, we always go from homogenized to heterogeneous and then go back and forth. Why don't we cut out some few steps? That's our goal in this. Have we solved all the problems? No, we won't solve it. We won't replace existing processes. We will have a niche area where this process makes sense. I don't know what that is right now. Gary may be able to be showed in ballistic. We are trying to push in creep resistance. 
we will have challenges too. We are trying to produce on the fire resistant. Yesterday there was a question. We have been playing with that too. But will it be a panacea for all the problems? No, I don't think so. That is not the intention of this talk. It's more about fix finding the solution where it can be make sense. Um, thank you, Suresh. Okay. Um, I guess.